angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting-edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports, unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity, welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. Good evening, folks. This is Tom Horn coming to you again with Skywatch Television. But we have some very special guests we're going to be talking with for actually the next few weeks here on Skywatch. We're going to be running a special series with our very good friends once again. And actually, just now returning from their expedition to Peru, Tiawanaka, Sardinia, uh, Steve Quayle, my good friend. Hi, Steve. Great Hi, to have Tom. you back. Well, I'm excited because today we're going to be talking about the True Legends, Technology of the Fall on Episode 1, and building on David Flynn's work, which obviously is in the David Flynn collection, Tim Alberino was the feet on the ground, he was the expedition leader, and having lived in Peru, being accustomed with so many native legends and knowing so much about Peru, it was a natural. He got to go back to a place he lived for 10 years and basically follow up on the Chronicles of the Conquistadors and Interestingly enough, Peru has the most complete accounts of giant intact skeletons and pre-flood and post-flood architecture. And as I understand, that's kind of, we're going to be talking about this new documentary series that you've started called the True Legends Documentary Film Series. This is episode one, The Technology of the Fallen. And that's what this trip was all about. I also want to welcome to the set today, Timothy Alberino. Great to have you here, Tim. I mean, I've watched you on the internet so many times when you're doing the Alberino analysis, which is also part of the Genesis 6, uh, or I think you call it Gen 6, Gen right? Gen 6. Uh, is the name of the documentary foam company. But we're going to talk to you quite a bit today. You lived in Peru for a decade. Yes, I did. Um, you actually speak the language. But tell, yep, me, about, Spanish. T tell me about this project. Uh, why'd you go? What's up? Well... Thanks for having us on, Tom. <laughs> Delighted to be here. Uh, we went to Peru for the reasons which Steve stated. Obviously, it was natural for me to go back. I lived there for 10 years. I know the culture intimately, and, um, and I, I know how to get around in Peru, and there's a lot of megalithic stuff going on. Everybody knows that at this point about Peru and Bolivia, but we also really wanted to follow up on David Flynn's incredible work, which we'll, which we'll talk about later, relating to Tiwanaku, the geoglyphs of Tiwanaku. And so Peru is one of the last places in the world, in my opinion, that you can get up close, hands-on with some architecture, with some megaliths that I believe there's no question were either built by giants or directly by fallen angels or somewhere, something in between. And, um, and so it, it made sense for us to go there. Just that was the natural choice for us to do our first, our first uh, not our first expedition, but our first episode in this series. Yeah, and I mean, you had some real experiences there. You're being followed everywhere you go. You said you felt the Vatican presence, but you also had the government presence. And you were telling me uh, last night at dinner about how the, there's like a cover-up, kind of in the same way that we've seen this here in the United States. There's an intentional effort to kind of cover up the true history. That's why this is called the True Legends series, is you're actually going back to even antediluvian times. And you said you found there like the difference between post and pre-flood yes. artifacts. This documentary is mainly focused on the technology of the fallen, meaning the architecture and the technology that was in play before the flood of Noah, and the pre-flood world, which is referred to as the antediluvian world. And yeah, there's a cover-up going on everywhere we go, whether it's Sardinia, whether it's Peru, whether it's Bolivia, we find that there is a very intentional historic narrative that is taking people away from the pre-flood world. That is, you know, in other words, there's nothing to see here. When you're looking at these massive, the massive wall at Sacsayhuaman, when you're looking at the, the amazing megalithic ruins of Pumapunku, the last thing that they want you to do, and when I say they, I'm talking about in Bolivia's case, the Ministry of Culture, mm -hmm. the government organization that runs the place, the last thing that they want you to do is associate what you're looking at with the biblical 
pre-flood world. And obviously we have a, uh, a view of the pre-flood world based on the sixth chapter Genesis, which talks about the fallen angels and the giants and uh, the other, uh, in the book of Enoch, talking about the other entities, sentient entities that were around in the pre-flood world that were building things, that were using high technology and secret knowledge that they were not supposed to have. Now, you, you mentioned David Flynn, and of course, Steve Quayle, and I knew David Flynn personally. He was a good friend. We both published Amazing. works by David just before he got sick and started dying. He was using Earth-orbiting satellites, and he started kind of imaging a grid system there. Tell me, tell me about that. And, and then, uh, Stephen, you and I, after David passed away, uh, we put everything we had together by him. We actually put it together uh, in this book. We called it the David Flynn Collection. You had published his first book called Cydonia, The Secret Chronicles of Mars. I had published Temple at the Center of Time. But he actually wrote some articles, and I'm holding this up for the audience because later we're going to tell them how they can get this together with the documentary film. Uh, uh, the, the, the grid lines. I mean, I, I remember at the time thinking that this was maybe the strongest evidence of pre-flood giants I had ever seen just because the size Absolutely. and scope of it was so Absolutely. extraordinary. What, what's interesting is in all of the geoglyphs or the rock carvings or the land ground carvings, they always have an aerial perspective, and only from the air can you see them as they relate. In other words, when you're on a horizontal axis looking straight out, all you can see is basically you can't see any further than the eye can follow the, the surface of the earth. But when you're in an aerial perspective, you can see all things, how they fit together. And what David proposed in the David Flynn collection is the fact that he thought there was a language that was literally written in the earth. Now... Since that time, and since Tim's been down there, and, and Tim can talk about the Kipu, Q-U-I-P-U-S, Q-U-I-P-U-S, a form of language, a written language, of even involving incredibly complex mathematics dealing with strings and knots. Mm -hmm. And I think that's critical because when you look at the evidence for this, it's, for instance, I think it's, high, it's been hidden in plain sight. So now I've got some Mensa level. Uh, a rocket scientist computer guy trying to follow it up and he said you know there's there's something here there's a pattern here so the kipu is is if you will if somebody saw it and say wow it's just a bunch of strings with knots on it but it's far more intricate than that and one of the things we'll be doing in the preceding series by the way this is uh this is only episode one uh as we're able to raise the funds and do we we plan nine even up to 12 of them because with the knowledge expanding so greatly and so quickly we got to stay on this i can tell you this i don't think there's anybody in this world because they don't see the urgency of the time that can put an expedition together in a matter of three or four weeks and get it done and that's all the time we had to do we have to move on it so tim yeah. share about that yeah and, and 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 this is the other thing is that tim is such a blessing because having lived there for 10 years he knows a lot about the culture he was telling me things at dinner last night where i realized if i had been there in the circumstances he was in i would be arrested and rotting in a jail down there somewhere where he knew how to get out of that uh, situation so Tell us about that. Now, he mentions this uh, complex language with strings and knots, and how does that tie to yes, what? Yes, Kipus was the language that the Inca elite had developed. Steve and I believe that they inherited it from somebody else uh, or copied somebody else. And when we say somebody else, probably referring to giants or some other kind of sentient entities. So uh, Kipus is, is, as Steve explained, is a system of writing, basically, that is coded with rope that's... The, the, with knotted rope and the different ways that the rope is twisted and people can look this up on the internet and see examples of kipus but it's usually like a ring of string coming down and, and every little twist and turn and knot in the string uh, represents something profound and when I say profound I mean it's conveying a whole lot more information mm -hmm. than, than we would ever think just looking at this twisted string and and what's interesting about kipus is that, again, it was only the elite, it was the priesthood of the Inca and the elite that could read it, and only they were allowed to read it. It was a very, very close-kept secret by the ruling class of the Inca. And so uh, we believe it comes ultimately from the mystery schools, and it's conveying uh, not only the history of the Inca, but we believe that it's, it's probably conveying a lot, of, a lot about the pre-flood world, because the Inca, and this is something that you'll never hear anybody really talk about, is that the Inca believed in a world before the flood of Noah, full of giants. 
The Inca believed and knew that there was a great flood that decimated these cultures. And of course, that's no surprise because you find that uh, all over the world. But uh, talking about the geoglyphs that David Flynn discovered viewing satellite images over Peru, Bolivia, all the way down, by the way, miles and miles, hundreds but, of and, miles. And, of I, and I think that's part of it is for people to understand the scope of what we're talking exactly. about here. These are deep crevices in the earth. They're cut in perfectly straight lines with these little knot-like images. That's why you're thinking that it's a, it's, if you look at it from heaven downward, it's a, it's a replica of a Kipu message of some kind. It looks, it looks very reminiscent of Kipus, and that, that is, by the way, what David Flynn was in And these run for hundreds of miles. Hundreds of uh, miles, yeah. Some of this is 11, 12, whatever, 1,000 square, I mean, uh, feet above sea level. It goes through plains Massive. and valleys. Yeah. It goes through lakes. I mean, who, there's no such technology. We couldn't do it today. That's why, that's why it's so critical. People ask us, Tom, you get the question, Tim gets a question, I get the question. Why is all this stuff relevant and important? Because this is, this is those events that I believe Daniel saw being revealed in the end times, you know, uh, being loosed, if you will, sealed up Daniel for the visions yet for an appointed time, for knowledge shall run to and fro. So the fact is, is that even more than that, I'm convinced that not only is it a language, but it also may be a genetic signpost, because where the knots intersect on themselves is almost like a triple helix, okay? And one of the claims that has yet to be evidentially proven but is suspected as is the triple helix of the fallen angels. Now I, I want to make it clear to everybody, fallen angels are that. They are angels. They can take on human form. When the fallen angels came to earth, Genesis 6-4, they had sex with earth women produced the giants. But they were proud of their children. And they're proud of their children, Tom, because we see that in the book of Enoch. We see that in the book of Giants, mm -hmm. the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. And the same Dead Sea Scrolls that we get a lot of our original uh, Old Testament passage, that was a big deal. So this wasn't an invention. It wasn't a fabrication of someone, uh, just a pseudopigrapha, meaning somebody writing under somebody else's name. But the fascinating thing about this is, is that when you go to Peru, of all the places in the world, that's where you have the most prominent, if you will. It's the Rosetta Stone in, in uh, geoglyphs and in giant architecture showing both before the flood and after the flood. And, you know, we get flack all the time saying, well, there was no universal flood. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, go to the top of Mount Everest and you find seashells. So, sure. But the main point is, is that they knew, the ancients knew prior to the flood that it was coming. So what, what, what you lived in Peru and now you're back there. You're, you're shooting this, um, this exploratory film. Uh, what do the Inca, what do, what do the people that live in Peru today, I mean, what do they believe about the megalithic structures? And also tell us about how you, th these things are almost side by side, where you have proof of, of uh, pre-flood mm -hmm. structures that are you know, beyond comprehension, and then the stuff that came after the flood that's still impressive but much smaller in scale. They believe the ancient astronaut stuff. Hmm. It's funny. They all know. I spoke in the University of San Martin in, in the city of Terrapoto, which is in the Amazon basin, during this expedition. And we talked to the university professors and we talked to a group of students at the university, did a presentation on, on Genesis 6 and on the megalithic structures. And it was amazing to discover that they all knew about ancient aliens. They all knew about ancient astronaut theory. None of them, none of them had ever heard a biblical explanation for the megaliths in their own country, including a couple of the professors that were believers, that were Christians, had never heard mm. an explanation uh, outside of the traditional explanation, the traditional historic and the ancient astronaut theory. So we were really presenting to the Peruvians themselves for the first time this idea that uh, there were fallen angels that had offspring that were giants, ancient technology, forbidden knowledge. It was, uh, it was surprising to them. Now, uh, I've understood that some of the earliest, um, you know, explorers, archaeologists that went into Tiahuanacu, they went up above Lake Titicaca, when they were talking, and this, what was this, a hundred and some years ago, but they're talking to the people that were living there at that time, saying, where did the gate of the sun, where did these giant megalithic structures, these giant stones, where did all this come from? And according to the explorers, then they were told, we don't know, it predates us, but our oldest stories tell us that these were built by giants. It's more than that, see, because the, the, the Inca themselves knew, they knew, 
and, and you're not going to hear this on ancient astronauts, <laughs> they, they knew that, that the Puma Punku and some of the older structures were built before the Great Flood decimated them. They knew this. This was common knowledge, not, not just uh, with the Inca, but with the, uh, the other natives that lived in the territory of Peru during and after the conquest of Peru by Francisco Pizarro. And what's really interesting is that when the chroniclers and the conquistadors came upon Good Tiwanaku, when they, when they arrived there, what do you think that they said about it? They said, look, evidence of the pre-flood world. That's what they said. They said the, they knew the Inca believed it, and they confirm it in the documents that we have uh, that, was, that were given to me by... And this is all going to be part of the document. Oh, yes. This is all featured in our documentary And, and, and you, you brought with you today some of the conquistador uh, reproductions. We've got the helmet. We've got the sword. But this sword, not, people... People will not be able to see the depth of this thing. I don't know if maybe they can go to the wide angle there. How, how long is that thing from the shield down there to the point? Well, from this is called a, a basket hilt or, or actually yeah. a cup Shell hilt. hilt. Yeah. yeah, cup hilt, the rapier. This one's uh, reproduction by cold steel, 41 inches. Yeah, the blade's 41 yeah. inches. So imagine this, ladies and gentlemen. The, and I'll let you give the background. But imagine putting that into the eye socket of an attached giant skull from the base of the hilt to the tip of the spear, going through the eye socket to the back of the head. To now, the, this is the records of the country. This, this is, is the records. historical records. That's yeah. a big boy, 36 and they, feet they, tall. These bones existed when they oh, invaded. Yes. And this is something, again, that, that uh, not many people have any idea of. And, and let me lay the background here. No, no, it, no, but quickly, I, and I want you to lay the background, but so what, how, how long did you say this is? 41 inches. And it inches. takes the length 41 inches to go in the eye socket and come out the back of the head. That's to how they, the back of the That's how they right. ma measured it. So now, if you, know, if you had a, uh, somebody who's good at measuring skeletons. Well, we did that. Bit, we did that, Tom, because someone's actually calculated it and using the standard parameters even of the uh, elongated skulls. The skull would be six feet tall. It would be 40 the inches. Skull. The skull. skull. The skull. The eye sock the back, 40 inches, and the, the eyes somewhere between 24 and 30 inches apart. How, lo how tall would that make the whole skeleton? 30, about, well, it, the conquistadors, tell them what the conquistadors yeah, said. Yeah, so let me give people a context for this. And we go through all of this in great detail in this. This is exciting this, stuff. In this DVD. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the context of the, of the documents that I was given while in Puno, which is on the shores of Lake Titicaca, by a very well-known archaeologist. He gave me digital files, digital copies of the actual records of the conquistadors and of the chroniclers after them, and, and the ones that were with them. They came from Lima, the, the records, the digital files. And, uh, and because I asked him, have you ever seen any evidence of giants in Peru? He said, well, I, as an archaeologist, have not. I asked him another question. Are there historical records of giants in Peru? He said, yes, there are. Yes, there are. So he went and, uh, and, he went and got those for me and gave the digital copies uh, of those documents on a disc to me. And I, and I reviewed them and was astounded. And he was astounded. He now, is this even... being reproduced in a True Legends yes, documentary? He, yeah, absolutely. Okay. These will be here. So the context of of what we're talking about in terms of the historical documents is the conquest of Peru by Francisco Pizarro and about 168 conquistadors in the mid-16th century. The chronicles that we have, the records that we have, are the historical records from which we derive the history of the conquest. And so what did the conquistadors say about the we're, height of this giant? We're talking about <laughs> these conquistadors took their swords, which are very likely rapiers or something, mm -hmm. something like rapier swords, and stuck their blades through the eye socket of this giant that was uncovered on the bank of the river. And as Steve was saying, the, the, the tip of the blade, it was so large that it went in through the eye socket and the tip of the blade barely touched the back of the inner cranium. And the giants in Peru, and it's an interesting thing is that the, the Inca believed, the Inca themselves and the natives, they believed, they knew that the giants before the flood were larger than the giants hmm. that came after and the flood. And this one, evidently, then, would have been 30 This must have been feet, a 30 foot. 32 foot. Easy, yeah, something and, like. and the appetite, each one of the giants, basically, it's almost, it's absolutely very similar to the book of Numbers in the Old Testament because these guys ate so much, they ate the equivalent of what 50 men would eat in a day, each giant ate. And then they basically ran out of food and they started munching on the, the natives, okay? Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, Tom. God in his mercy to us has basically provided a time lock on information that hasn't been seen or maybe has been seen, but no, no one paid attention to it for over 450 years. 
Tim goes down there, 21 day expedition, and, and meets these different people. They've never heard the biblical narrative, and yet right there during the time of the ancient alien fantasy land, okay, that's my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uncovering things I believe that God has had hidden, so there will be no denial. And, and, and you know, when the, when the devil comes in uh, like a flood, you know, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard. Well, the standard has always been truth, and that's what we're after, the truth. And so, by the grace of God, we've uncovered a lot well, of stuff. Well, uh, okay, folks, True Legends, the documentary film series, Technology of the Fallen is episode one. Now, I've got to see some of the film that's going into this. I haven't got to watch the whole documentary yet. It's absolutely unprecedented, and some of these documents like you're talking about are extraordinary and valuable because they give us the true eyewitness accounts absolutely. rather than the sanitized accounts that we're getting from governments that both there, here, and around the world want to try to control. Because, you know, this stuff flies in the face of the evolution theory. It's, it, it, it flies in the face but it's very supportive of the biblical Absolutely. chronology. Yes. It, it, shows, it shows global evidence for a flood, for giants. All right. We are going to be making this documentary available to you. It is in our store. You can get the documentary for $24.95. Uh, we're also putting it together with the David Flynn collection. We'll be talking about that more as to why. Uh, some of the research that Dave had started when he was friends with me and Steve Quayle, then wasn't able to finish, and you went there to finish it, of course. Uh, the two of those together available for $39.95. That's a $60 value, uh, but you can get the film by itself if that's what you choose to do. While we have you gentlemen here, we're going to keep you for four weeks. We're going to talk about some of the other books and products, too, that you have available. Uh, but but tell me about Sardinia real quick, because we're going to run out of time in well, about let me, two let minutes. Let me really quickly also mention that we also visited a alleged Stargate. Uh -huh. We went to Pumapunku, we went to Tiwanaku. So it wasn't just uh, about the giants and stuff. We went, we went and checked out Aramumuru, you know, so we did a... Uh, it, that's in this episode. So that we, we investigated Stargate, Giants, Pumapunku, Tiwanaku, Lake Titicaca, UFOs. It's all in here. This Amaro Muru, if I'm saying it right, is that the, the, the famous image where there's like a rock with like a doorway? Yes, into? it is alleged to be a, and, and what are, to be a Stargate. Yeah, well, so, but why? I mean, what do the Well, we go ship? into that in the documentary, ah, and, we, and we expose some things that, that uh, we found surprising there, too. But in terms of Sardinia, yeah, before we, we, before we went to Peru, we actually went to Sardinia first. And uh, that's, uh, we haven't put that episode together yet because we wanted Peru to be the first episode. But yeah, we found some amazing things in Sardinia. I'd never been to Sardinia or Italy for that matter. But when I went to Sardinia, I could not believe what I was seeing there. I mean, you talk about evidence of giants. I've never seen evidence for giants like I saw in Sardinia. And not only that, there's evidence that Sardinia might have been the location of Atlantis. There's actually some very strong evidence for that. We found pyramids, huge pyramids in Sardinia that nobody ever talks about and aren't really registering on, on, in anybody's minds when they think about megalithic structures. And the whole thing is completely covered up. Yeah. What else can we look forward to in the documentary, Steve? Well, the documentary is going to put a lot of uh, puzzle pieces together. And I think this is what's interesting. As you and Chris and your research team goes out and does what you're doing and, and all the work that you're doing, we're doing it. It's complimentary, ladies and gentlemen. Again, we don't sit and clear each other's uh, uh, projects. But what's fascinating, Tom, is it's like we've had the border all these years, and now we've got the puzzle pieces and the pictures coming out loud and clear. And I believe that that's because of God's love for his creation, that he doesn't want people taken in by the lies that are going to be basically forced on them. And I want to thank you very much, too, for allowing Skywatch Television to be the first one to break the news on this new documentary film series. I know this was a large budget operation. You're there. You're on location. I'm, I'm looking at the back of this. Who were the true builders of these impossible constructions? Why are there deliberate deceptions concerning their origins? Was there high technology in the pre-flood world? I mean, you guys, this is, these are the questions that the world is asking. When they watch, uh, you know, some of these television programs like Ancient Aliens, and, and, they, and they always fall back to this, well, man, I mean, it had to be people coming here from another world. It had to be aliens, yeah. because, it, because there's no way in the world. And yet the, and yet the Bible has the answers. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, right? Yeah, and they all 
always they always will quote things out of context. They don't even talk about the original words. But you know, it's amazing. They'll take Anunnaki, you know, the the, the star uh, gods. Yet they won't take fallen angels. Yet they absolutely are are embracing everything the fallen angels taught mankind in the, their sin and rebellion against God. All right, we're going to talk about that in the next program. Uh, 2495. It's the brand new documentary. It hasn't even been available until now. You can get it in our store. You can get it together with the David Flynn collection, 3995. Steve, Tim, we got to have you back on the program again. Next time around, maybe we'll talk about who those uh, megalithic builders were. God bless you, folks. Thank you for joining us today on Skywatch Television. Coming this November. I'm not sure that the world is ready to receive this. Tom Horn. Joe Artis. Donna Howell. And the Skywatch investigation team join a host of global experts in the conclusion of a multi-year undercover inquiry that exposes what the U.S. government, the FDA, and monster corporations have been hiding from you. We're talking about everything from the food that we eat to animals and pet animals to ultimately humans. Literally, what we have been doing with genetically modified crops, what we have and are doing with transgenically made animals, we fully intend to do with the human race. I mean, how many people know right now that the last scientist in Congress, Bill Foster, recently spoke before Congress. He wrote an article for The Hill in which he says that right now the top science departments in our government that dole out taxpayer funded revenue have already been ordered to literally create the guidelines that are going to be used for genetically modifying the human race. I think 90% of Americans would be shocked if they learned that their cats and dogs were eating these diseased meats and euthanized pets. Euthanized pets. During our investigation, we were able to verify that if your pet Fluffy had been euthanized at one of these vet clinics or one of these shelters, it would be recycled into food byproducts, toothpaste, cosmetics, deodorant. The stench is overwhelming. It's unbelievable. Coming in November, an unprecedented, official and imposing undercover report that exposes what government agencies and greedy corporations are hiding about a genetic menace that is slowly, quietly, secretly killing and transforming all of creation. They have made a Faustian deal with the devil. I'm talking about our government. They have sold out the best interest of Americans to greedy monster corporations that are in their back pockets. Coming this November exclusively from Skywatch TV. Dead Pets Don't Lie. Inhuman the Documentary. Survive the Future.